Welcome everybody to um, Three Ways to Plan Ahead for the Second Half of Life. I'm Margaret Barrett, owner and founder of Safe Harbor Estate Law. And um, if you can hear me and see me, please put yes in the chat. I just wanna make sure that the tech is working properly for you and we will be starting in about a minute or two, in a couple of minutes. So, um, okay, Tracy, Connie, Brad, Sheila, thank you. I'm glad you can hear. Everybody else who's just coming on, please sit, put yes in the chat so we know that you can see me and hear me and our tech is working for you. Kelly? That's great. Hi, Carol. Really glad you could all join us. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a few more people. So if you can say yes in the chat, then we know you can hear us and see us. And everything is working fine. And we'll start here in just a minute. Okay, my clock says six o'clock, and so I will get started. It uh, sounds like people can hear us and see us. Welcome, everybody. If you are attending today, it must be because you're looking for more information on estate planning in Minnesota or Wisconsin. So you probably live in one of those states and I'm guessing you're interested in estate planning because either you've never done it before or you need an update or maybe you're just confused and you need to know what the next steps are for you. So this is meant to be an educational program, helpful for you to answer the question, what can I do for my own protection and for my loved ones? And these concepts apply generally to all states, but I'm going to focus on Minnesota law because that's our primary jurisdiction, but Wisconsin is very similar. This is not meant to be legal advice today. It's meant to be educational. So if you feel that you want to ask the question, well, what should I do in my particular case? I'm not going to be able to answer that during the webinar for two reasons. First of all, this is a public forum, and I, it's not appropriate to answer that kind of question publicly. And secondly, we don't have an established attorney-client relationship. So this isn't meant to be a consult about your specific legal needs. It's an educational webinar. We want to educate and empower you to make the best decisions for you. So um, since we're getting started, anybody else? Hi, Dave. Anybody else who's joined, and I see there are a number of other people joined, please say yes in the chat so that we know you can see me and hear me so that everything is working. Okay, thank you, Fran. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, it's okay to exit the room and come back, or you can check your internet connection and your speakers to see if they work. If you can't solve the problem, don't worry. About 20 to 30 minutes after we end, you will get emailed a video recording of this talk. And you'll still have an opportunity to connect with us afterward too if you have a question that wasn't answered in the talk. So um, if you are able to stay on though, there will be a Q&A. There will be a 40 minute presentation followed by about a 15 to 20 minute Q&A afterwards, which is a massive advantage for those who are able to attend live and stay on. Keep in mind the parameters I mentioned about legal advice at the beginning. And remember, there are no stupid questions. So let's, um, well, thank you for the note, Betty and Patty and Marcia. So thank you everybody. Um, let's give you a little roadmap about where we're going to go today. So first of all, in the next 30 minutes, you're going to learn the three ways to plan for the second half of life. 
Second, you'll learn that estate planning can be smooth sailing and how to obtain the peace of mind and protection that you are seeking. And at the end, we'll have time for Q&A, like I said, so save up your questions till then, or as we go, feel free to put them in the chat because I will first answer the questions in the chat at the end. This webinar is for you if you are worried about leaving a mess behind for your loved ones, or if you're not really sure if estate planning is for you. And third, if you're interested in making sure that what you want to happen will happen after you're gone, or if you become incapacitated, you'll wanna listen. And what's exciting to me about you being here is if you act on what you um, learn here today, you're gonna to start taking steps to get ahead of 75% of Americans. That's right, less than 25% of Americans have a complete and updated estate plan. And that percentage is getting smaller all the time. As you complete your estate plan, you and your loved ones will be protected and provided for. You and your family will avoid hassles and expenses and stress, and you can have the health care that you want. So who's Margaret Barrett? Uh, if you missed it at the beginning, I'm Margaret. I'm the owner and founder of Safe Harbor State Law. And I can relate to my clients because of personal experiences I've been through in my life. I was born and raised in East St. Paul and there were eight children in my family. And I founded this firm in 2013 and every day we help clients just like you. We do planning the right way here. We do it honest, very thorough. We treat our clients the way I would want my parents to be treated. Right now we have 12 employees and three attorneys all delivering service at a high level. Like many of our clients, I have experience with elderly parents, including dementia. My siblings and I work together now to support our mother who recently turned 90 and our dad who passed away three years ago from dementia. And like some of our clients, I experienced an untimely death in our family and a messy estate afterward. I want to share a little bit more about that story with you. I will never forget how I woke up on Monday morning, March 10th, 1987, 25 years ago. I was alarmed to hear the phone ringing at 6 a.m. I was instantly awake and as I raced down the stairs, my heart was beating fast and my mind was thinking, who's calling? What, what happened? What's the emergency? I heard Barb's voice. She was the sister of my former husband, Joe. So I immediately knew something happened to Joe. And Barb said, Margaret, I don't know how to tell you this, but Joey died in a car accident last night. I was shocked. He was only 39 and he was already gone. And it was too late for our children to say goodbye to their beloved dad. It was traumatic, scary, life-defining moment. And if you've ever had that experience where you get that kind of knock at the door or phone call, I think you know what I mean. So next, I braced myself to wake up my son, Ben, who was 11, and my daughter, Monica, who was nine, to tell them their father was gone. So much changed immediately. And for the next several years, much of my life revolved around walking my children through the grief and dealing with all of the adjustments. But to make matters worse, the estate was messy. Joe had an estate plan to his credit, but there were two problems. It was not updated for changes in his life, and the plan was drafted by a divorce attorney who did estate planning as a small part of his practice. So we soon, soon learned that there were problems with the estate planning documents, and the problems worsened the family dynamics, resulted in a lot of hassle, pain, and expense. The legal battle lasted seven years. It went all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court. So in addition to dealing with the grief and loss, I walked my kids through more than seven years of estate litigation that could have been avoided and very minimized and about $100,000 of attorney's fees. I don't want you or anyone to go through what our family went through. And that's why I created the smooth sailing system, 
The system's designed to walk you through the process of creating a comprehensive custom estate plan to protect what is most important to you. You might be asking, why do an estate plan? This is my family. This is a picture of my parents and kids. That's who I think about when I think about having an updated estate plan. These are the people I do not want to leave a mess for, and I still want them to get together for Thanksgiving after I'm gone. Who do you want to protect with your estate plan? It's a good thing to think about. So our goal is to help you identify your custom ideal estate plan, since estate planning is very personalized. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to give you an opportunity to speak directly with our client intake specialist, Gabrielle, who's also on this presentation, to discuss your current situation and to get you started. So now we have the introductions out of the way. Let's dive into the three ways to plan for the second half of life. To help you understand the three ways, we'll reuse the remote control, the slide, and the bucket. Next, meet Mary and John. This is a pretend couple based on some real clients of ours. So John is 70 and Mary is 68. They have three adult children. Jennifer's 44 and she's on social security income for a physical disability. Jason is 42. He's had some struggles with chemical dependency and when that happens, also financial struggles. And Scott, who's 40, is responsible generally so they have a $400,000 home in St. Paul, $250,000 in retirement savings, $115,000 cash, and a cabin in Wisconsin that's worth $250,000. They each have a car and they live off of Social Security, pension, and their retirement. So the first planning strategy we'll discuss for John and Mary is the remote planning for incapacity. There's a couple documents that everyone over the age of 18 should have in place in case illness or tragedy strikes and they're unable to take care of their own financial, legal, or medical decisions. We use a picture of the remote control for this planning because you're giving specific individuals control over your most important decisions. Let's say that John and Mary have to go through what some of my clients have had to go through. So let's say John first called me because Mary had been diagnosed with early onset dementia a year earlier and she had had tests the previous week confirming their worst fears that the dementia had rapidly worsened much faster than expected. John feels overwhelmed, ashamed, and guilty because he hadn't called our office right when Mary was diagnosed to get the papers signed. Now he's afraid that she won't be able to sign the papers. My heart went out to John because I knew if Mary wasn't able to sign the papers, they would have to spend thousands on a guardianship conservatorship, going to court, putting Mary on the witness stand, which would be very hard for her. Thankfully, it was not necessary. I had a comfortable conversation with John and Mary and determined that she could sign. And John had called us just in time. So fast forward a few weeks, John and Mary are sitting in my office, happy to be signing the estate plan documents. And John especially was relieved to finalize his plan to take care of Mary and their three grown children. And the burden was off his plate. Part of our smooth sailing system is for every adult to plan for becoming incapacitated. And that means you're unable or unavailable to make decisions for yourself. Please do go ahead and put in the chat the, the, any one, two or three of the documents that you, you think people need if they lose capacity. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So you might lose capacity due to a car accident or be unable to express your wishes due to illness. It could be a temporary condition or it could be permanent and it can happen at any age. Incapacity planning is very easy. It's hard to say, but it's easy to do and relatively inexpensive to take care of ahead of time. But if it's not a place when you need it, it can be very difficult and very expensive, especially since COVID. There's an extra hearing required and it's, it's more difficult. So you need three documents to ensure if you lose capacity, you'll still get the care and the financial decisions you want and your loved ones will have smooth sailing without having to go to court. What are those three documents? Healthcare directive. Yes. Dave wins the prize. 
which is that you can come back tomorrow and attend again. That's all the prize I got, Dave, sorry. So, um, okay, so healthcare directive. Yep, advanced directive, Judy, is another name for it. And um, that's the same thing. So most commonly called healthcare directive by attorneys in Minnesota. This is where you appoint people to make your healthcare decisions for you and to give you direction on your wishes. Because of a relatively new law passed in 2016, if your doctor prescribes mental health treatments for you, you can now give your agent permission to approve those tr treatments without having to go to probate court and have a civil commitment hearing. All of our clients have wanted to include that special intrusive mental health treatment language in their healthcare directive. And FYI, as of today, I still have not seen that option in any of the free healthcare directive forms out there. So if you have one, that is something to check. The next um, one document is a power of attorney. And this uh, is where you appoint people to give direction for making financial and legal decisions on your behalf. If you don't have it, your loved ones have to go to court if, if you can't sign for yourself to get permission to sign for you. The third one, no one ever guesses. It's pretty new. It's called the Digital Asset Authorization. In Minnesota and Wisconsin too, you can give the people you appoint to handle your affairs while you're alive and after you're gone, the legal power to get access to your digital assets with this Digital Asset Authorization. In Minnesota, this was adopted in 2016 after a tragedy. Jake Olson of Orono went off to college at the University of Minnesota. After finals his freshman year, he went out to a, um, a party, ugly Christmas sweater party, and sadly and tragically, they found his body um, deceased and frozen down by the river the next day. The cause of death was unknown. His uh, cell phone was found near his body. So of course, his family wanted access to his cell phone to find out what happened to see his messages and photos, and they wanted access to his laptop as well. They wanted to know what happened. They also wanted these things for sentimental reasons. They were not allowed access though ever, even though they paid for the phone, they paid for the laptop, the phone was on his father's plan, and, and they paid for that too. However, Jake was 18 and they didn't have written permission to access his records, so they were not able to. The Olsons were so heartbroken that they pushed for this digital asset authorization in Minnesota so that your family can avoid the heartbreak and problems that they faced. Recap on the first step, the healthcare directive the power of attorney and the digital asset authorization are the three documents everyone over 18 needs in place as a remote control to handle their affairs if they're unable to themselves. Let's go on to number two. Judy, this is um, what you already guessed, the will. The will actually does not take effect until after you pass away. That's why it wasn't in the first slide. So the second way to plan is a will package which we liken to a slide, and I'll explain that more in a minute. Wills are basic foundational estate planning tools that are helpful when you pass away, but it might not control as much as you think. We use the illustration of a slide with wills because they're a quick, fairly uncontrolled method of wealth transfer. Picture John and Mary's three children at the bottom of the slide with their hands out. And and, and this is after the second of John and Mary, they're both passed away now. And John and Mary's assets are at the top coming down the slide to them. Each child will receive their one third share all at once. They may or may not be a good thing. It may cause problems for the daughter who is on government programs, or if the son is currently um, not handling his finances well. The will won't protect the inheritance for them. You have to be okay with that reality in your situation when the time comes. For some people, a will can make sense, and for others, it doesn't. Some of the pros and the cons of the will are, or things to think about, pros include you can get the assets to the right people most of the time. Most of the time, it's going to go the way it's said in your will. 
and I'll explain a little bit more about the times when it doesn't. Second, you can avoid probate in the right circumstances with proper titling and beneficiary designations. Third, it, it can work quickly, especially if you can avoid probate. And fourth, it's less expensive than the next alternative, which is a trust. So some things to think about are, it controls less than you think, it doesn't allow you to add specific rules, and transfer and death deeds and beneficiary designations have some risks that you may not have heard about. So let me go a little deeper on those. It controls less than you think. So the will only controls assets that pass through the will. So if you have accounts with beneficiary designations, those normally don't go through the will. Or if you have joint accounts that are owned with someone else, that doesn't go through the will. That will pass directly to the joint owner. So for example, John and Mary could say in their will, they want their state divided equally between their three children. But if they have Jennifer joint on the checking account, when they pass away, Jennifer is going to own the checking account and it won't be going through the will. She doesn't have to share it with her brothers. This fact surprises some people. So we want to make sure that you understand that. Joint accounts and beneficiary designations will usually pass outside the will. And I would say they trump the will. They're going to override what the will says. The second thing about wills is that um, they don't allow you to add rules. Like Johnny gets his money, but only once he turns 25. Or I would like this money to go to Susie and I want her to use it for college. Or a lot of our clients will say, I want this to go to Bob, but I want them to save for retirement or something like that. There's no way to have rules like that in a will. So even if you ended up leaving money to grandchildren, um, you cannot control when they get it and at what ages. So the third thing to think about with a will to see if it makes sense to you has to do with having real estate. Think about your home if you own your home. If you pass away, your loved ones are going to probably want to sell the property, get the cash and take advantage of the step up in basis so they don't have to pay taxes on the increase in value. But in Minnesota, you can't sell until you go through probate normally. And so whenever you own property, it forces you to have a probate, which means you can't sell it until you open a probate with court, do publication, get the letters testamentary, get the Medicaid clearance and all that. And so to get around that, because people want to avoid that, they like to use a transfer on death deed, or it's usually known as a TOD. And this can sometimes work slick and sometimes not. So if John and Mary's three kids all survive them, and there's a tie to those three kids, and then the three children and their spouses all cooperate, the six of them could work together to prepare the house to sell, list it, you know, agree on who's, what price they're gonna sell it at and who's gonna you know, be the one they sell to. And if they can all work together and do that, well, that's great. But let's say if Jennifer predeceases her parents or they die together in a car accident or something, her, John and Mary probably want her one third to go to her children. But more likely, um, because you can't do anything sophisticated if then scenarios with a transfer and death deed, her share is probably gonna go to her children, I mean to her husband or to her grandchildren outright and not in a trust, which is probably not what they want. Similar problems can happen with beneficiary designations uh, on, on the accounts. They can sometimes end up going where you don't want them to go, depending on contract language of the financial institution or um, maybe the order in which people die sometimes. So also, if you are like John and Mary and you have property in another state, then you are going to need to have a probate in that state as well. That's called an ancillary administration. And you really have to redo the whole probate in the other state with all the expenses and all the delays. So let's talk again about Mary and John uh, using the will. So they're gonna name each other as what's called personal representative to handle the will. And then they'll name an alternate, maybe one of their kids. 
They're going to give one third to each kid in equal shares per stirpes, we say. So if a child predeceases them, their share would go to their grandchildren. Um, and then they're going to name beneficiaries. They're going to name the spouse's first beneficiary and then each of the three kids, um, each getting one third as secondary beneficiary. If either of them becomes incapacitated, they'll act for each other because they'll have the power of attorney, healthcare directive, and the digital asset authorization. Now let's assume John passes first just because he's a little older. Everything will go out like right to Mary if it's owned jointly or if she's the first beneficiary. And that can often go pretty smoothly when the first spouse dies. Um, if they have less than 75,000 passing through the will, that's the limit in Minnesota, then they're gonna to need to do uh, an affidavit of collection to access the accounts. And this is much quicker and easier than a probate. So keeping the estate going through the well under 75,000 is very helpful. When Mary dies, now the remaining assets will go to the kids. And most of it would go outside of probate if everything is done properly. Um, and then that may not be best for John and Mary because uh, the one son doesn't handle finance well and Jennifer is on government benefits and her money may effectively end up going to the government. So there's no buffer with the will to help with those kind of issues with inheritance. And then if they didn't have a transfer on death deed, if they decided not to do that, then it will take months to go through the process of opening the probate and getting the permission to list the house and selling it. And so, um, that is John and Mary's strategy for a will. So the third way to plan is the trust package. This is what we call, um, we're using a bucket for an example. This is called a living trust and it's also called a revocable trust. They're really the same thing. It includes all the things in the will package, the remote, and there's a will also, but then you add in the trust, which is the bucket and, and some other trust documents with it. For the trust, we use the bucket because it carries your assets while you're alive and after you pass away. Typically, if you're married and you own your assets together, you're going to share a joint trust. If you have separate assets, uh, then you're going to have two separate trusts. And trusts are especially ideal for blended families and, and some other situations like business owners. So let's talk more about the pros of a trust and some things to think about. A trust has more control and structure than a will. It can include conditional logic like if this, then that. For instance, if one of my child predeceases me, then the money's to be held in trust for my grandchildren, and this is who I want to be trustee, and this is when I want them to get the money, and at age 30, they can have half of it. And at 35, the other half, whatever's left. Um, logic like that, for example. Um, if anybody is on a government program, then we can create a supplemental needs trust to protect that for them. There, there are many if-then scenarios in a trust to plan for things that may or may not happen. Um, the trust does not die like we do. So after you're gone, the trust lives on and your wishes are continued to be taken on, uh, carried out for a period of time. It minimizes taxable estate. In Minnesota, there are estate or death taxes due if you have 3 million in your estate. If you're married, you can double that 3 million to 6 million by having a trusts, a, a certain kind of trusts. Next, um, the trust protects from creditors, from divorce, from bad financial decisions. So if your children are inheriting money, but they're going through divorce, it'd be better to get the money a little bit later, or they're maybe um, going through treatment or going through bankruptcy right then, the trustee can hold up the money until a better time for them. You can protect a child with special needs from being kicked off of benefits because they inherited money. And then that way the child can actually benefit from the money you're leaving them. Um, lastly, the trustee has immediate authority to sell property, distribute assets, and take care of things. So you don't have to open a probate. You don't have to have a transfer and death deed. The trustee can just move forward and sell the house. You don't have to get six or 10 people to cooperate on it. Or like in my family, about 16 people would need to cooperate to sell a house with, out of a, with a Todd. 
So some things to think about with a trust, it's more expensive now to draft, it's longer. Um, and we realize that not everybody can afford that. And it, it is a more uh, simple, a lot of people come to us and they ask for, we, I want a simple document so I can have a simple estate. But what really happens usually often, at least is that um, a more complicated document will make the estate more simple. <laughs> so they, they are a little complicated. They take a little more time, they cost a little more. And the last thing is it can take a little more time when you're moving assets, because when you put, for instance, your checking account in trust, you're going to need to change the auto payments because the bank will make you open up a new account. We just want everybody to know there's a little more work up front on that. So I gave you a lot of details. I want to do a quick recap. For wills, they're quick and straightforward, especially in the drafting and preparing. They are the lowest investment and the least involved. They work well if you don't have a need for control after you're gone or, or protection, special protection of people because they're going to get that money quickly through the slide. Fourth, the best if you have one property or if you don't own property. Um, and we include a power of attorney and healthcare directive um, are included. So we always want to plan for incapacity as well as after you're gone. To recap the trusts. So trusts are best if you want to control or structure the way certain beneficiaries receive their inheritance. They're best if you have multiple properties because trustees can sell it right away, especially if there's property in another state. Um, it protects assets if a beneficiary predeceases you with a if then, if then, then that scenario. Um, they're more expensive now, but they have a higher potential to avoid probate. And they are more flexible and powerful if you lose capacity. In particular, if you are worried about running out of money, paying for long-term care, and you want to protect assets, and you still want to qualify for um, Medicaid to come to pay or Badger Care to pay for your care, trusts have some really neat provisions that we can put in uh, that may be applicable in your situation. They can save a lot of money. I know I given you a lot of information and we are going to have Q&A in just a couple of minutes. So um, first, I said we set aside some time to speak with you individually about your objectives and our process to see if we can help you accomplish your goals. And everything you learn today is going to help you be prepared for the future. But as you've probably figured out, we're just scratching the surface here. So if you click on the schedule your call button, which should be popping up on your screen, you can book a 10 minute call with Gabrielle Schleisman to listen to your goals, discuss our process and determine if our foot, our firm is a good fit for your needs to move forward to the next step. It's, there's no commitment here at all. And then, um, what Gabriel will do is set you up, if you're interested and we're a good fit, with a personal Zoom or in-person life and legacy session with Don Thompson. She's our client relations manager. And Don will, or Gabrielle will discuss your expectations moving forward, answer questions. If we're not a good fit for your needs, we are happy to discuss alternatives and provide recommendations to you. We really are here to help you and educate and empower you to figure out what's best for you. What's the catch? <laughs> you might be wondering what the catch is. Well, there's no catch aside from limited availability. Well, uh, while I'm giving this talk, I'm, I'm looking at this owl, but a bald eagle just came and landed out of a tree right outside my window. <laughs> okay, so um, we have set aside uh, 10 spots this month for webinar attendees. That's the only catch. We only have so much time. We close our calendar after the 10 meetings have been scheduled. So click the schedule your call button now to secure your spot for the introductory call. And once all 10 spots are taken, we'll close down the link until the next webinar. We limit our availability to offer exceptional service to all of our potential clients. And we know this can be an overwhelming process. Our job is to help it to be less overwhelming. We do have another webinar at noon tomorrow too. So, so you guys get first dibs on filling up those spots. As a thank you, 
when you book a call with Gabrielle, she will send you a couple of free resources that will help you get started with planning. If, and I think you'll find them helpful. I know, again, we did cover a lot of information and now is the time to get your burning questions answered. I really wanna address what's on your mind. So I'll stay on for another 15 to 20 minutes to answer your questions. So please put them in the chat now. And, um, and I'll, I'll start at the top, but I don't think there were any um, questions yet in the chat. Don't be shy. <laughs> That's Gabrielle. Are you? Do you have your um, your camera on? Yeah, my camera's yeah. on. The schedule your call button is over your picture. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm wondering if there was a, a person who signed up from Wisconsin. I'm not sure. Do you have to see an attorney for all this? Okay, Sheila. Um, that's a great question. And I actually have, is it a video or a written up thing I did about doing your will and legal? It's a video. Solution? I can send it to you, Sheila. It's a video. She can visit, Sheila, she can send you a video I did. But um, do you have to? No, you don't have to. You could do it yourself. I mean, and we say that when, <laughs> I know when Dawn meets with you, and this is really, I really, even if you're thinking about doing this yourself, I would recommend you talk to Gabrielle, and if you're comfortable, talk to Dawn. It's complimentary, it's confidential. It's not high pressure or anything. But we can get to know your situation, and then we can tell you the pros and cons of will versus trust for you, and the costs and the process and the whole thing, and then you can decide. Um, and I think that will help you decide better. But I will tell you that um, I highly recommend it. I think that um, we attorneys make a lot more money if you do it yourself or do it on LegalZoom because we see a lot of really messy probates afterward. And what's even sadder than having an expensive and messy probate is having your money go to somewhere else other than where you wanted it. And we see that time and time again. And that is really heartbreaking. Or people who uh, they think they have a good power of attorney health care directive, but they don't. And then we have to go to court and get a guardianship conservatorship and it costs $10,000. And this is at a really stressful time in their lives. So I, I recommend you see an attorney and an attorney who specializes in estate planning. And also if you're 50 or older, I would say an elder law attorney who does estate planning would be the best. Um, but you can do it yourself or go online or whatever, but I really think it's well worth it to go with an experienced estate planning attorney. I know, I know it's kind of self-serving, but I would recommend you go to someone else if you didn't want to go to us. Okay, Tracy, we have a will that is 20 years old. Do we need an update due to estate law changes? Well, there's a good chance of that, <laughs> um, but maybe not. And so I would recommend for somebody who might need an update, that's a great question, to, to talk to us. Um, you can do a preliminary conversation with Gabrielle and then talk more with Dawn. And if Dawn always has questions, she always, you know, checks with me if some, something she can't answer. Um, so it partly will depend on uh, if situations have changed in your particular situation. So some laws have changed and some, sometimes they're fine and sometimes they're not, but we like our clients to check in every three years. So we'll reach out to you once a year and every three years offer you a free meeting just to see if things are up to date. One of the biggest problems with estate plans is people don't keep them up to date. And we know that's really easy to do. So we try to stay in touch and just say hello so you remember us and um, let us know what changed so we can tell you if it needs changing. What is that attorney called? Okay, wait a minute. I think I'm getting behind that questions. I'll go a little faster. I answered Sheila's. Okay. Connie. Does a revocable trust protect your assets in the event you go to a nursing home? No, no, common misunderstanding. An irrevocable trust that you do more than five years before in Minnesota could. And because we're elder lawyers, we do lots of planning to protect assets for the nursing home. That's a different talk. Um, but you can um, talk to um, Gabrielle. If you make an apartment with Gabrielle, she can help you with that too. Um, but a lot of times, one of the first steps people do is get their estate plan in order. And as part of that, we start working on 
protecting assets from the nursing home. Okay, Patty, you have two trusts created many years ago, one for your husband and one for yourself. We don't own a business. Do we need two separate trusts today? Well, I don't have a lot of your details here. So this is falling a little bit in what I said at the beginning that I can't give too much specific advice because we don't have an attorney-client relationship and partly because these rules are to protect you, not me. Um, partly because I don't have all the details. So um, sometimes we do separate trusts for married people. Most often we do joint. And um, from what you've told me, I don't see a reason to have separate trusts, but um, it kind of depends on how much your assets are. Years ago in Minnesota, the Fed, the estate tax limit was 1 million and now it's 3 million. So there's a lot of people who don't, um, don't need two trusts anymore that maybe did before. But again, you can check into us and we, we would look at that if you would like us to. Um, it's another lawyerly answer, maybe, it depends. I can't say for sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, but if you, um, I guess I could say this also, Patty. Most of the people, when we do tax planning to save on estate taxes, if they have over $3 million, we still use one trust. You don't create the second trust usually until after the first spouse dies. So you still usually do one trust for that. But if you already have two, a lot of times we just go with it. So and we have to look at the individual situation and an attorney has to kind of dive into it. Um, oh, I, Sheila, an attorney over, yeah, an estate planning attorney who practices elder law. Because people over 50, you know, you start thinking about maybe how am I going to pay for long-term care and am I going to spend all, lose all my money to the nursing home? And what are those Medicaid rules? No one knows what they are really. And except the people who work with it all the time. And um, so they're hard to follow. Yes. Oh, Betty, you, I think you're asking a similar question to what was it Sheila asked. Do you have to see an attorney? She asked, and Betty said, can documents be obtained without involving an attorney? Well, um, so you can do that. Sure, you could do it yourself or you could go online and try to find some documents or you could use LegalZoom or you could use a plan through your employer with an attorney who does not very much estate planning at all. That's what happened to Joe and uh, the legal fees of his estate were $100,000. So, I, I mean, I, I, I can't recommend it. I can't recommend doing it without an attorney. Um, we often have people come in and they'll say, well, I already did my healthcare directed myself or I already did my power of attorney. And I always say, well, yeah, we'll look at it for free. You know, <laughs> we look, can we look at it? And, um, you know, once in a while they're fine, but usually we can point out a couple things and say, well, there's this and there's that. For instance, the healthcare directive normally doesn't have that provision I talked about and we explained it to them better than I, did in this short webinar, and they they usually decide to have us redo their documents. Um, so the the thing is, when you prepare these documents, if they're wrong, you don't find out about it till too late. So you don't find out that your power of attorney healthcare directive is wrong till you lost capacity and you can't fix it, and you don't find out the will is wrong until you're gone and you can't fix it. So it's a big risk. That that's my opinion, but. Um, I, I would recommend you see an estate planning attorney. If you have a trust, you need a will. Sheila, that is a great question. You do. It is required, first of all, but it also has a function. So um, so the, the trust is the bucket. Then the slide, the trust actually slides into the bucket. So what it says is if there's any mistakes, like it could be a financial institution that didn't do a beneficiary designation right, or maybe you missed it or something, um, if anything is not in the trust that's supposed to be, the will will make it go in there. And if the trust failed for any reason, the will would still have things go the proper way. So you, you do have a will. It's short. Um, yes, Gabrielle said you can schedule your call with her any day of the week. It doesn't have to be right now. Um, do you have time right now, though, Gabrielle? 
I don't have time right now. So. <laughs> you know, oh, that's right. I didn't think so. Okay. So it doesn't kind of be right now. It's starting, but, um, starting as soon as tomorrow morning if you click the link. So um, tomorrow oh, morning into okay. next week. So just, I was just saying it doesn't have to be, you know, today. If you don't have time today, we have plenty of spots. Okay. Marsha, Marsha thinks she signed up for Monday at 930. Can you check that, Gabrielle? Yeah, I can check that really quick. Make sure it works right. Right. You, um, okay, we do hear from people that um, they like to do these meetings soon after the webinar because they remember you know more of the material and i know how it is when it's all new it's it's helpful it can be overwhelming so do what works for you but that the, we've heard that from some people that they're glad they did it you know as soon as they practically could afterward so i hope i've answered your questions as uh, you know well enough for today and we can certainly take advantage of talking to Gabrielle next if there's more you'd like to know. Um, you can follow us on social media if you want, on Facebook or Instagram, because I put out short, like two, three minute videos pretty regularly. And there are also a lot of them are on YouTube if you want to learn more. And there are some things on our website too, if you want to poke around there. Um, Marcia or Marsha, I don't see you at 9.30 on my calendar, um, so you might want to try again, but I can send to you the link um, to just via separate email and you can sign up. Um, tried twice. Okay. If anyone else is having trouble, just put it in the chat and I'll just email it to you directly. Just let me know. I I think I have a note that nine people clicked to schedule, Gabrielle, so I don't know if you, hopefully not all nine are having a problem. Yeah, I know. I've also have popped up on my email, so usually it sends an email confirmation to me, and I've gotten a couple. It just, Marcia's wasn't on there, so. I think it's Marcia, but okay. Can you see it? Yes, yeah, so we'll send an email with the website address. I'm not sure if it's on the webinar when the, that this software sends, Gabrielle, but um, can you make sure we send an email with the website and a link to sign up for you in case it's not working for people? Yep, I always do that. Um, Kevin and Kim, I'll send you guys a link to the webinar tomorrow too. Sounds like you guys want to. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know how else to do that, I guess, unless you find the ad on Facebook or something. 9.30 is no longer available. Um, maybe you guys can just talk and connect. Marcia said 9.30 is gone, so. Um, Gabrielle will work with you on it. She's very easy to work with. I'm sorry about the trouble, Marcia. That hasn't happened before. It might be, Marcia. I just might be not seeing it on my end yet. It might be that you're in the 9.30 slot. I don't know, so <laughs> I'll double check it, so. Okay. We'll make sure we get you in. We set aside, we specifically set up side time before these webinars so that people can get in while it's fresh in your mind. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? It's not 646. So I think it stopped raining and I'm happy to answer a few more questions, but if you wanna get on and enjoy your evening, that's good too. You're welcome, Tracy. Thank you for being here. I'm really honored for each one of you taking the time. I'm glad you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important step and I'm glad you took it. These are easy things to put off, but really important things. You're welcome, Carol and Marsha. And you, you know, you also get the recording. Don't forget that. Yeah, you'll get the recording. If you don't get it, yeah. let us know. Here, I'll put my email in the chat if anybody. Okay. Yeah, Gabrielle at safeharborestatelaw.com. That's the just, website. Yeah, Safe shoot me an email if you need anything, if I missed anything, and I'll make sure to send it to you. Um, and then if you don't get the recording, it automatically sends 30 minutes after the presentation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's just technical difficulties with the platform. So if that happens, then just let me know if you don't get it. But you should get it. Check your junk mail first because it might go into there. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't get it after 30 minutes, just shoot me an email and I'll send it over to you. Not, not tonight, you probably, but we'll, I'll go tomorrow morning. <laughs> Can you move to the next slide, Gabrielle? Oh, yeah. Hold, please. Okay. Sheila wants to be part of the new one. 
Um, yeah, Q&A, is, it is always interesting. Um, Kim, this uh, Demio software we're using to present it, it automatically sends it like 20 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. after. So we actually don't do it, it's automatic. Yep, Sheila can be a part. Maybe you should just email everybody in this one with tomorrow's link, Gabrielle. I'll try it. Yeah, I'll try to. I've got everybody screenshotted, so I'll see what I can do. Oh, vehicles. Patty said, now that vehicles are so expensive, do these need to go into the trust? Um, what we do, well, this is typical. Uh, you sign a document at the signing that puts your personal property in the trust, and that effectively puts your vehicles in the trust. But you don't have to go retitle. Um, that's usually what we do. Um, Betty, you're just starting the process. Good for you. Great information. I'm glad. This is our motto. We want to educate and empower you to do what is best for you and your loved ones. So anytime we add value, we are happy. I think that's about it. This is very interesting. Thank you. You've been a lively group. This is the first one we did outside of regular work hours. And so I'm just experimenting with some different times to see what works for people. So noon tomorrow too is maybe lunchtime for people. We're hoping so. We'll just keep trying some different times. Okay. Well, you are all very welcome and thank you. Very honored that you signed up. Have a great evening. Enjoy the spring. If it ever gets sunny here, it will be great. <laughs> and I'm sure it will before too long. So um, watch for our emails and let us know. Oh yeah, well, we're doing more of this same one right now we're focusing on. And if you get on our email list, will they be on their email list afterward, Gabrielle? Yes? I think Gabrielle's gone. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, if you are on our email list, it, when I give other talks, like in person or webinars, they might not be like advertised ones like this, but sometimes uh, I'm invited to be at a webinar somewhere, a Zoom presentation. Um, you'll hear about it. And that one is called How to Not Lose Your Life Savings to the Nursing Home. That, those two are my main talks, this one and that one. And that's kind of the most important things that people need to know. Okay, thank you. Have a great evening, everybody.